Um, good morning. Welcome to the City Planning Commission's uh, public session. Um, Madam Secretary, please begin. Good morning. This is the City Planning Commission public meeting held in Spectre Hall, 22 Reed Street. Today is Wednesday, March 19, 2014. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and beepers. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card at the desk outside of Spectre Hall. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony, please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chairman Weisbrod? Here. Vice Chair Knuckles? Here. Commissioner Battaglia? Here. Commissioner Bessa? Here. Commissioner Cantor? Here. Commissioner Cerullo? Here. Commissioner Chen? Commissioner De La Uz? Here. Commissioner De Turo? <coughs> Commissioner Dweck? Here. Commissioner Edie? Here. Commissioner Levin? Commissioner Marin? Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, March 5th, 2014, and special meeting of Monday, March 17, 2014. Um, on the minutes, I make a motion to approve. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Scheduling. On calendar numbers 1 through 5, we have resolutions for adoption. Scheduling Wednesday, April 2nd, 2014, for a public hearing to be held in Inspector Hall, 22 Reed Street. Uh, motion to approve. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page 5. Borough of, Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 6, CD4, N140191, ZRM, in the matter of an application for an amendment of the zoning resolution concerning Manhattan West Text Amendment for a favorable report as modified on calendar number 6. Chairman Weisbrod? Aye. Vice Chair Knuckles? Aye. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Recused. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. A favorable report as modified has been adopted on calendar number six. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number seven, CD9, N140268, PXM. In the matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space for use of property located at 431 West 125th Street. For a favorable report on calendar number seven, Chairman Weisbrod. Uh, I would uh, just like to commend the borough president. I think this is the first time a borough president has uh, opened this storefront, and um, uh, I think it's a very good step forward. So I vote aye. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Battaglia. Yes. Commissioner Bessa. Yes. Commissioner Cantor. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Chen. Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number seven. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number eight, CD1, N130304, ZAR. In the matter of an application for the grant of an authorization concerning 153 Highland Avenue. For adoption on calendar number eight. Chairman Weisbrod? Aye. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Battaglia. Yes. Commissioner Bessa. Yes. Commissioner Cantor. Yes. Commissioner De Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Chen. Yes. Commissioner De La Uz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Edie. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Calendar number eight has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number nine, CD three. N140148 RCR in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 34 Rockefeller Place, I'm sorry, Rochelle Place, for adoption on calendar number nine. Chairman Weisbrod? Yes. Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Calendar number nine has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 10, CD3, N140148, RCR. In the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 7380 Highland Boulevard and 11 Massachusetts Street South. 
for adoption on calendar number 10. Chairman Weisbrod? Yes. Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner Delaus? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Calendar number 10 has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 11, CD3 and 140148RCR, in a matter of an application for, an, for the, the grant of a certification concerning Halton Avenue and Herbert Street. For adoption on calendar number 11, Chairman Weisbrod? Yes. Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner Delaus? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Calendar number 11 has been adopted. The next part of the calendar is a public hearing section on page 8. Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 12, 13, and 14. Calendar number 12, CD 14, C130313, MMQ. Calendar number 13, C130314, MMQ. Calendar number 14, c 130 203 ZMQ, a public hearing in a matter of applications for amendments of the city map and the zoning map concerning Grand Central Parkway rezoning. Colleen Anderson. Good morning, um, Chair Weisbrod and Commissioners. My name is Colleen Alderson. I'm the Director of Parklands for the Department of Parks and Recreation. We're the applicant um, for the three ULERP actions before you. The Shiva Hartara is the co-applicant for all three applications as well. I'm here to just to give a few remarks and then um, answer any questions that you might have. Um, the three actions before you relate to mapping changes and a zoning text amendment. Um, the first involves a parcel in the Glen Oaks um, neighborhood of Queens. It is a portion, involves a portion of the Grand Central Parkway. It's a landscape vegetated area enclosed by a fence. It is not programmed with any active recreation facilities. That parcel, which is about 27,000 square feet, would be demapped, conveyed to the yeshiva, and in the text um, text map would be reflective of R32, which is the zoning district for that immediate area. The purpose of the conveyance and the demapping is to help facilitate the yeshiva's um, improvements to their access to the school. Um, currently, they have a situation where it's about 400, 500 students, a very limited parking area, and so it makes it very complex for parents of children who are coming to the school to drop off. There's also It's also used as a play area. So the idea is that the Grand Central Parkway parcel will help improve the safety conditions of that situation. The second part of the application um, involves a park addition. Um, so the idea is that um, about um, a small portion will be added to an existing park. Um, this is about 12,000 square feet. So we're mapping the existing parkland that had never been mapped before and then adding 12,000 square feet. That parcel is currently privately owned and would be conveyed to the city for park purposes and added to the park. And it is the idea is that it will supplement the existing park resources there. Currently, there's a playground and open asphalt area. These actions are mutually beneficial both to the city and to the yeshiva. It will help improve the safety conditions for the school. And at the same time, we will see an addition to the park. Um, this action was approved, the alienation of parkland and the conveyance to the yeshiva was approved by the state legislature in 2004. So we're here today to help facilitate the improvement, the, the um, actions that are required to, to complete this. Thank you, Ms. Alderson. Questions? Ms. Good morning. Uh, as I look at the middle map, the alienated piece of land that we're talking about, the piece you're looking to spin off, is on the wrong side of the street relative to the off-ramp from the Grand Central Parkway. Um, you said they're going to be using that for parking? That is the contemplated idea, yes. 
Well, that would mean that the children would have to cross that street to get to the cars? That's a nasty street. I know it. No, no. Um, I well, think... When I say street, the off-ramp is right there, coming off Grand Central Parkway. It swings just around to the green before you either go left or right. And you come out of there kind of fast. Um, well, uh, let me point to the map. I think the idea, and the gentleman from the yeshivas here can speak to what their thoughts are about okay. how to make this work. But the idea, I think, is to... Then what's on the other side of the road? Am I missing something? This is landscaped area, part of the parkway right away. Are you, you're not claiming that as well? Just the no. green area? Okay. Just the green area. Okay. The yeshiva is located right here. Yes, I know. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Ms. Delos. Um, Ms. Alderson, thanks Ms. for being here. Yeah. Um, and You've been before us before and certainly described things in detail. I'm just wondering, could you review the um, square footage of the privately owned parcel that uh, will be become parkland compared to the area that's currently a park but not publicly a park? Sure. Um, the parcel that would be added to the existing park, William T. Gunn Park, is about 12,242 square feet. The parcel that is uh, contemplated for conveyance to the yeshiva is 27,000 751 square feet. As an obligation of the state legislation that was passed, um, there's a requirement that the land have fair market value or that the idea of uh, the, the, the funds that are required to make it equivalent would be used towards park improvements in the area. So what will happen if, if should these actions be improved, uh, approved, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services would do an evaluation of the fair market value of the parcels and that if they're not equal, the idea is that Yeshiva would um, make a contribution towards park improvements in the area. We've contemplated if that, should that be the case, that they be used at William T. Gunn. We do have some capital funds in the budget uh, for, uh, for improvements there, but it would be open discussion with the community. Actually, uh, Vice Chairman Knuckles. Uh, yeah, my, my question was also related to William T. Gunn uh, or the addition. Yes. So 87th Avenue, which is that portion of it that's going to be, I guess, demapped. Correct. Um, is privately owned. Correct. So the yeshiva would buy that private parcel. Uh, is there any question as to whether or not the current owner wants to sell it? I mean, is this yes, a there's been foregone conclusion? Um, there's been um, active engagement with the, it, that actually the area outlined in blue is privately owned not by the yeshiva but by a little league mm -hmm. that was formerly state land that was conveyed to the little league mm -hmm. and so the yeshiva has been coordinating with the little league organization and they have actually passed a resolution in favor of the conveyance of the parcel. Mm -hmm. um, just the area that is um, to the park um, but technically the land actually has to can be has to be conveyed to the state and then will be conveyed to the city at no cost um, so that is the requirement when land the land was conveyed originally to the little league organization mm -hmm. so procedurally does the conveyance have to be made to the state before the transaction with the yeshiva on the city owned land is is completed? they will be they will be done at the same time. We will not convey the Grand Central Parkway parcel until the other parcel is conveyed to the city. So we've been in close coordination with the state, mm -hmm. with the Little League, and, of course, the yeshiva. So we're all working together. Well, Little Leagues can be tough, so I, I hope, yeah. you, know, I hope <laughs> yes. you can get the deal done. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Ms. Alderson, when does the fair market value determination get made? Has that been made, or does that happen uh, just before the time of conveyance? Um, you, typically, DCASs operates that their um, their evaluation has to be within six months. So six months of what? Of of the conveyance. So typically, they would do it so it's cur a cur current value. Right. So um, that will be happening. You know, very soon or shortly Present. after, if, should this be approved. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Alan Steinberg. Good morning.
morning. My name is Alan Steinberg. I'm the vice president of the yeshiva, and I want to thank you all very much for giving me a minute or two to say hello and say thank you. As you've heard, I also thank the Parks Department, Colleen Alderson and, their, and Jose Lopez for their presentations. And as you asked some pointed questions, this goes back to 2004. I have six children. They've all gone to the school, and I was always hoping that this would be done before they all graduated. Uh, we started in 2004, and here we are at the end. But we've done our homework. We've spoken to the neighbors. We've spoken to the Little League. We've spoken to the area. And our school has also grown at the same time. So this, what, what this will do is that we see this as a win-win situation. And actually, this piece of land right over here, right, which, which, sir, um, Commissioner Cantor, there, there's no crossing of streets, okay, which is very important. We've actually put up a gate to protect the children because people exiting the Grand Central come off at pretty high speeds. So... cut here that's already been here, that was used many, many years ago. We, the Yeshiva actually bought this land in rent from the, from the city. For, and, and this was one lot at one point. So, there's, so we're going to be using this as a, as a way to come in and go. So therefore, to alleviate the traffic here. We're going to come in here and go into the school. There will be a few parking spots here. But usually, we're going to try to get rid of this traffic area and put it here in a much slower area. So therefore, and also the, the, uh, the gun park uh, is right next to a school as well. So therefore, they will have more area there to build. So this, 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 there's nothing could, that could be done on this lot. It's a very awkward lot. The only thing that could be done is what we're going to be doing with it. The other lot uh, is a nice rectangular right next to a park. So while there will be discussions in terms of valuation, is that how did you determine 12,000 to 27,000? This was um, Senator Padovan and uh, at the time uh, Senator um, a, a City Council Weprin who really felt that they were cl very close in value because this wasn't usable land and at, at all for anybody. You couldn't turn it into a park. You couldn't do anything with it. It's only it's a, it's a crescent shape, and the 12,000 square feet could be used and developed or whatever and used that to a park. However, however it comes down, we're prepared to do whatever is necessary. But you should understand is that they we're talking like what's 12,000 square feet, you know, on Fifth Avenue as opposed to 27,000 square feet in New Jersey. It's the same type of thing. They felt that they were of equal value. That's why it, it did that way. Uh, but however it comes down, we're prepared to do whatever is necessary to make it, make it right. And I thank you very much for your time, and thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. Mm -hmm. Questions? Mr. Steinberg. Yes. It's a long walk from Jersey to the job. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, will the buses still queue where they're queuing now alongside the uh, off-ramp? No, actually, it, um, the, buses, the buses right now, they queue actually up here mm -hmm. in front of the QCP. Are you familiar with next door to the Queen Center of Progress? So what we hope is that the buses will be able to pull in here. Good. And therefore, these, we have these major city buses that are just waiting here to come in, drop off the kids, whatever. We're hoping to have a line up here where the buses can come here and the children can walk down here to get onto their bus. That makes that turnout less dangerous. That's correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Ms. Vesser. Thank you, Chair. So will the Little League services be, be completely eliminated or relocated? Well, appa apparently, the I'm not that familiar with the, with the Little League. Apparently, the Little League is, 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 is fully functional and everything's wonderful. Apparently, they had an, a, a large piece of land over there that was given to them by, by the state for the Little League purposes. Uh, and they don't use it. Uh, and there's part of it that they don't use. And actually, part of it is not even a ball field. It's actually tarred. It's underground. Okay. So they, this is that they didn't use it. And how did we even know about it? Senator Padovan knew that he gave them a certain pieces of land that they don't even use. So this is, Senator Padovan said, well, this would be a win-win. We could take it. It's, it's, it's raw land right now. So the, the uh, Little League passed it. The, they don't even need it. So they're actually donating it in exchange for this. Thank you. Thank Ms. Battaglia. Good morning. Good morning. So you mentioned your six children, and you've roused my curiosity. <laughs> um, is this a K-8 through eight yeshiva? Uh, N-8. through eight. 
And through eight. Yeah, I have one of my, my son graduated here. Oh, I was okay, going, so. that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Did any of them graduate before <laughs> this happened? Yeah, I have, uh, and, and they're in city schools. They're at Queens College and one's at Hofstra. But uh, three, three have graduated and three are still there. That's what keeps me involved. You know, and I said, you know, because once my kids graduate, I won't be that involved anymore. Well, that but, wouldn't be nice. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, high, the high schools want me. But I, I, I've been the chairperson of this project since 2004. And matter of fact, interesting, and I'll leave you with this note, is that bef just before he retired, I went with the principal, Rabbi Minchel, to see Commissioner Benepe, and I took a picture that I had of my son on, on Lot B. I said, my son was three years old when we started this project. My son is now in eighth grade, okay? I said, you know, I know the wheels of the city move rather slowly, but if you could help us get into Ulip, because uh, I know that moves slowly, but at least it moves. Okay, <laughs> okay, uh, and and that's why Commissioner Benepe was very happy. And sure enough, my my eighth grader, who was in kindergarten then, is is now uh, graduating this year, and it looks like it's going to be done before he graduates. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just happy you used uh, New Jersey and not Brooklyn as an example. Oh, first of all, Brooklyn uh, Brooklyn real estate now is is quite expensive. Are there uh, other questions? Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. The, the wheels of government do grind slowly, but they do grind forward, generally speaking. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, are there any other speakers on this matter? The hearing is closed. Thank you. Okay. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 15, CD 10, C140207, HAM. A public hearing in the matter of an application for a UDAP designation, project approval, disposition of city-owned property, and disposition of city-owned property located at 260 West 153rd Street. Thank you. Uh, Brian Tews, am I pronouncing that correctly? Brian Tews, I represent Curtis Ginsburg Architects. Oh, can you hear me? I represent Curtis Ginsburg Architects. Uh, I'm just going to walk through the design of the building. So the proposed building is a seven-story uh, residential building, uh, which includes about 16,000 square feet of community facility. The first two stories of the building contain um, all of the community facility, with the top five stories, including all of the residences, which is uh, 51 apartments. So on the, the first floor of the building, uh, as you can see, you know what, I'm just going to do it. That's good. I'll put it up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So I just want to describe that the building has three separate <laughs> entrances for each use. Um, the two community facilities are one is a daycare, the other is a nonprofit HCCI offices. The daycare is approximately 10,000 square feet. The HCCI offices are about 6,000 square feet. The residential lobby also enters off the ground floor, and also on the ground floor are uh, parking, which is required for the building. So basically, um, and then when you get up to the residential levels of the building, we've, we have all of the amenities for the residences at the top on a setback terrace, which is uh, accessible from some of those amenities. We just tried to break up the scale of the building with uh, separate colored bricks um, and variations of smooth and textured bricks to fit into the scale of the neighborhood and create a little bit of interest and break down the scale of the building. Um, that's, it's in essence, pretty much what we're proposing. Questions? Thank you. Uh, questions? Ms. Delos? Hi, thanks for being here. Are there um, any uh, green elements that you can highlight for us? Uh, 
in the building, no, it's not a lead building, but we do in general. We're using as much uh, LED lighting as we can. Um, it's a, you know, the envelope. We try to design everything. Every building we design is is you know high performance, continuous air vapor barrier. Um, we meet all of the energy requirements. I think um, we are applying for uh, NYSERDA. You know, I think it's the uh, multi family green building. family performance program or something. Um, so you know, for, for for what it is, it is a it is a high performing green building. It's not a lead building. So given. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Tooze. Uh, Malcolm Punter. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Malcolm Punter. I'm the Executive Vice President of Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement. And in that capacity, I'm responsible for uh, their ACCI's real estate assets and development as well as ongoing operations. ACCI's board of directors approved the 260 West 153rd Street project in or about 2012. They gave ACCI a mandate. That mandate was that these units should be affordable to the people living in uh, Central Harlem Community Board 10. In that regard, we have had a relationship with a for-profit developer called L&M Development Partners, Inc. for the past 15 years. ACCI has developed and improved blocks on 148th Street between Adam Clayton Powell and Frederick Douglass Boulevard, a, a, a corridor that was devastated 20 years ago. And if you walk through that block today, it is a tree-lined block with a mix of low-income housing, affordable co-ops, affordable condominiums, as well as market rate condominiums. It is a beautiful community. We want to do the same thing to West 153rd Street. ACCI, in partnership with a separate developer in 2008, developed the David and Joyce Dinkins Gardens building. That is an 85-unit building with uh, set-aside units for youth aging out of foster care. That is a successful project. It was, it was eligible for uh, LEED Gold. Um, and in fact, ACCI completed that project under budget and was able to include 96 solar panels on the roof in addition to other uh, green elements. So in partnership with l and we proposed at the 260 site to include the two city-owned lots as well as a lot owned jointly by ACCI and l and lot number one. We would like to build 51 units of affordable housing, not at 60% of ADI, but at 50% of ADI. And including, uh, and 43 of those units will be at 50%. In addition to that, we will include eight units at 30%. And the way the, 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 uh, construct, the uh, financing budget will allow us to, to uh, include 30% of AMI because we applied and was awarded with New York State ACR eight project-based Section 8 vouchers. We also have proposed as a long-term goal of ACCI is to build daycare center in that corridor. Daycare is a much-needed element in uh, the Bradhurst area of Harlem, so we propose to build a 10,465 square feet daycare. And also to make ACCI more efficient we're going to centralize our offices at that location. Mm -hmm. So not only will we have a daycare, but ACCI will be there to monitor as well as provide services to the community in a more efficient and effective manner. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you very, Thank you very much, Mr. Punter. Questions? Ms. Pataglia. Good morning. I take my, my hat off to you. It's a very commendable uh, development, 51 units of affordable housing at 50% of AMI. Um, in our briefing on Monday, we were told that eight of these units would actually be marketed at 30% of AMI. Is, is, is that, 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 is that is remarkable. It's remarkable. The second question is, I know you're incorporating a daycare, and I was just curious to know if the daycare center is funded. We have um, a LOI with Bright Side Academy um, who 
wishes to operate there, and they will have sourced their funding to operate ongoing. I wish we will build out the space, and we hope that they will be successful. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Delos? Hi, Mr. Hunter. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I agree with Commissioner Battaglia. This is a commendable project and much needed at these uh, AMI and income levels that you're targeting. And congratulations on getting the project-based Section 8 vouchers. Those are hard to come by. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I, I believe there's some units set aside for folks living with HIV and AIDS. Just wondering about on-site services that might be provided, um, as well as um, whether or not HCCI is going to be providing the management or if you're going to contract that out. Um, and then uh, I know that uh, because you're a nonprofit but you're partnering with a for-profit, sometimes there are sticky concerns that come up about permanent affordability, and I'm wondering if that was discussed um, with your partner and if that's something um, that you hope to achieve, even if it's uh, not at this stage. Again, our, our, uh, thank you for the question. Our board of directors has mandated that this project is affordable, and, and I point to our recent partnership with uh, L&M. In 2011, we actually partnered with them to rehab 447 units in this very same area. And uh, in that project, we committed to additional 40 years of affordability. So for 260 West 153rd Street, the initial period will be 30 to 40 years of affordability. And how about the management the management, the property management of the building will be um, performed by an affiliate of uh, l and called CNC Management. And in fact, they are the managers for our other assets, the 447 units, and we found them to be very effective. And in, in, in regards to the uh, units uh, under the HCCI Scatter Site Housing Program, which is a grant afforded to HCCI by New York City HRA, uh, we will continue to administer those uh, grants, um, those apartments, and we actually brought our uh, acting vice president for that program here today to observe. But you know, we are committed to operating that, and we can do it effectively from that that uh, location. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Punter. Thank you, commissioners. Derek Brooms. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Derek Brooms. I am the President and CEO of HCCI. Uh, as a brief uh, prelude, I thought I would never live to see this day. You know, this project, when I started there as a CFO, it was 10 years ago. Now I'm the President and CEO, and I know all of the, the vicissitudes that this project went through. But let me say that we not only in housing, and HCCI is a multi-services organization. Uh, since our inception in 1986, our primary focus had been on the Bradhurst area of Central Harlem. In that 27 year of history, we have developed more than $500 million of real estate portfolio, comprising of more than 3,500 units of affordable housing, 50 commercial space of 90,000 square feet. You ask about the AIDS program. We have been contracted with HRA from since uh, 1999 to provide 60 affordable uh, units for specialized housing for AIDS patients. And that contract, you know government, that contract has been renewed six times. We're in our seventh year so closely, but 21 years, we have that contract. Also, what we have done in the new project that we have, the David and Dinkins, we have set aside 18 units of housing for youths aging out of foster care, which is a very, very sensitive population. And that has been uh, working very, very successfully. Aside from that, we have sort of uh, uh, outreach to more than a thousand residents over the number of years, preparing them from public welfare to jobs. We have computers in there, and this is what HCCI funds by itself 
by using developers' fees. We don't get any funding from the city for that. We have also an uh, Intel clubhouse for young people who after school come there and do experimentation in graphics. They are so good that the city has given them a grant to do the anti-smoking. So this is one thing. We have brought kids from the street and put them to good work. We have impacted on the lives of about 20,000 people. Our fame as such, as a model, as even we had people from the German government came to see how HCCI is able to develop affordable housing. This project, and as my vice president explained to you, this project, and I'm looking at it from a macro uh, view, this project will do significantly more than one thing. The first thing it will do, apart from the housing aspect, it would help us to demit all of those storefronts that are not being efficiently occupied and put them in the commercial sector. That commercial sector will generate income now for those buildings. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Brooms. Uh, questions? Mr. Eady. Hi. Good morning. Um, I'd just like to say hello to Derek and Hi. <laughs> um, also to commend the work HCCI has done over the years and also its relationship with L&M. It, the partnership has been a real model over the years in terms of redeveloping and revitalizing the neighborhood. I'd just like to say thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Commissioners. I second that motion. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ken. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Brooms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Basha Gerhardt. Good morning, Commissioners. I am Basha Gerhards, Deputy Director of Land Use, here on behalf of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer to support with conditions HPD's application for 260 West, 153rd Street Apartments. This application is for a designation of city-owned property as an urban development action area, approval for the project as an urban development action area project, and approval for the disposition of said, to, said uh, property to nonprofit organization Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement and l and &M Development Partners. These actions will facilitate the development of a seven-story mixed-use building with approximately 51 units of affordable housing and community facility uses consisting of office space for HCCI and a daycare space with an open terrace. The proposal of 51 affordable units and provision of daycare services and the continued and expanded services programs of HCCI have created a laudable development proposal. The proposed development will allow for the consolidation of the many diverse social services HCCI offers, from job training and youth services to health and wellness services for individuals li living with HIV AIDS into a single facility, increasing ease of use by the neighboring population. These services are currently offered out of eight separate storefronts within the local vicinity. The consolidation of offices also allows for expansion of the types of supporting services HCI, HCCI offers. The proposed development also includes the inclusion of a daycare center, which together with the HCCI services and the creation of 51 units of affordable housing are highly appropriate uses of city-owned land and address local and citywide needs. HPD's disposition of this site will promote the sound growth that is necessary to obtain the UDAA and UDAP designations. The proposed affordable housing development will be financed through low-income tax credits through the state and federal project-based Section 8 vouchers. With any city-owned land, it is important that the city seek permanent affordability to assure public benefits are felt across multiple generations. The affordability period for this development is set at 40 years. While this is by no means permanent, given the development team's track record of providing affordable housing and given the investments already made into the community's health and well-being, we feel there is a reduced risk of the units becoming market rate at a later date and the development remains appropriate. However, given that there are already a number of boarded up storefronts, vacant lots, and deteriorating buildings in the vicinity of the development site, the borough president is concerned about an additional eight storefronts becoming vacant as part of HCCI's consolidation at the development site. 
In conclusion, the borough president recommends approval of the application as long as the applicant works with the community board's small business services and the borough president's office to fill the eight vacated storefronts with neighborhood appropriate small businesses or services and makes all efforts to ensure that all units remain affordable to residents of the neighborhood after the 40 year affordability period. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gerhardt. Any questions? Thank you very much. Fabia Walters. Am I pronouncing your first name right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, Chairman Weisbrod, Vice Chair Knuckles, Commissioners. My name is Thebia Walters. I'm the Director of Manhattan Planning at HPD. I am pleased to testify in support of the West 153rd Street Apartments, which is being sponsored by Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement and L&M Development Partners. The project will be constructed on two city-owned lots and one lot that is owned by HCCI. The project will create 51 units of rental housing that will be affordable to households earning between 30% and 50% of AMI. The project will include a community facility space that will serve two functions. As you've heard, um, HCCI will consolidate their program and office space into a portion of the community facility space within the new project, um, and over 10,000 square feet will be used to house a daycare center. The project will also include 18 parking spaces and 26 spaces for bicycle parking. The project was awarded 9% federal low-income housing tax credits through um, HCR and eight project-based Section 8 vouchers. Um, the development team anticipates obtaining um, 420C um, tax abatement um, and a small amount of HPD subsidy. And given the deadline to utilize the tax credit award, the project is expected to close in June of this year, um, and construction will start shortly thereafter. So these units will be online within the next couple of years. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Walters. Any questions? Ms. Delos? <laughs> always. Um, thanks for being here, as always. I'm, I'm just, uh, you don't necessarily have to answer this question today. I think it's more of a broader question, policy question, about um, disposition of city-owned land for projects and whether or not there's thought for that alone uh, being a trigger for permanent affordability in the future. Just a thought. Yeah, no, I think that conversation has been going on for a few years now, and, um, you know, there are times when we can achieve them, um, definitely, obviously, through the inclusionary housing program, but... And this is obviously deep affordability, many public benefits. Right. The units will be entered into rent stabilization, so that will have a long life. Um, and then just given HCCI's mission, um, we anticipate that they'll be back to restructure this. Thank you, Ms. Battaglia. Good morning, Ms. Walters. Nice to see you here again. Um, I think I know the answer to this question, or at least I hope okay. I do, but will there be a 50 percent community preference for Absolutely. this development? Absolutely, for Community Board 10. Great. And the, the HIV age units, will they have to flow through the lottery or will there, there be a separate mechanism for them? I think they're coming through a referral through HCCI. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Ms. Walters. Thank Any you. other speakers on this matter? The hearing is closed. Borough of Manhattan, calendar numbers 16 through 19, calendar number 16, CD4, C140181, ZMM, calendar number 17, C140182, ZRM, calendar number 18, C140183, ZSM, calendar number 19, C140185, HAM. A public hearing in a matter of applications for amendments of the zoning map and the zoning resolution for the grant of a special permit for UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of city owned property concerning the Clinton URA Site 7. Um, Ted Friedman. And let me, let me just note that um, Commissioners um, Cantor and Cerullo have not disappeared. They're just recused on this particular <laughs> matter or recused themselves on this particular matter. Do we have a quorum? Yes. Uh, yeah. um, Mr. Weiss Friedman. Chairman Weisbrod, uh, Vice Chairman Knuckles, and members of the Commission, 
Um, I have a uh, written statement that I would like to read into the record, of which I also have 20 copies of, with which the Commission's permission I will file as well. <coughs> My name is Theodore Friedman. I'm an attorney, and I have come to this hearing on behalf of the Women's Inter Art Center, Inc., to ensure that there is a written record of the status of the center's development rights at 543-551 West 52nd Street under the proposed ULERP actions, map changes, and text amendments covered under item 16-19 referenced above. When the center, Women's Inter Art Center, first became aware of the proposed changes, having noticed on the Community Board Number 4 website the Community Board's letter, of January 31st, 2014, to Vice Chairman Knuckles. Jonathan Bing of Wilson Elsa, the Women's Inter Art Center's pro bono governmental relations council, called then general counsel of the planning commissions, David Karnofsky, to ascertain whether footnote three on page 11, which states that all of the Women's Inter Art Center Inc.'s rights were preserved was accurate. Mr. Karnofsky had Mr. Barack Robel, Planning Commission's Assistant General Counsel, get back to Mr. Bing. Mr. Robel stated that the changes had been drawn, keeping the center's project in mind, and that in his opinion, the Women's Inter Art Center's development plans would not be negatively affected. Mr. Bing suggested that the center have a land use attorney double check. Albert Butzel, Esquire, was retained, and he spoke with Planning Commission's Julie Lubin, Acting General Counsel, who assured Mr. Butzel that the action will not affect the center or its continuing rights in any way. However, Mr. Butzel assumed that Margot Lewitton, she is the president of the Women Inter Art Center, would still want to make a statement at the public hearing summarizing the reassurances and requesting that if she had been misinformed, the City Planning Commission so notify her immediately. Ms. Lewitton, unfortunately, was unable to arrange to attend today's hearing. Ms. Lewitton asked me to attend in her stead. Ms. Lewitton noticed that the 73,772 zoning square feet referenced in footnote three did not comport with the final square footage approved by the city and EDC in the fall of 2000 when the HUD financing and grants went to contract. Paren 74,978 square feet of gross above grade building area is the correct enumeration as demonstrated by the quoted material below. Ms. Lewton also noted that under item 19 of today's calendar, the property at 543-549 West 52nd Street is misidentified as being part of Block 1080, comma, part of Lot 103. Whereas, now what should I do? Stop reading. Can you, can you submit the statement? I'd be happy to do Thank it. you. Um, questions? I don't, let me just, you're testifying in favor of this subject to the conditions outlined in your and statements outlined in your uh, statement. Is that correct? That is correct. I have okay. been actually a little more ambiguous in my responses to that being inquired of me twice before, in that I explained, assuming that the representations that have been made to Ms. Lewitt are correct, we have no objections to the project. Were they found to be not correct, it would be otherwise. Got it. Uh, questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Friedman. Thank you and your statement will be submitted and distributed. Paul Slee. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Weisbrot and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Paul Slee. I'm the Executive Director of the Ensemble Studio Theater at 549 West 52nd Street. And I'm here representing our theater and a number of fellow tenants in our building and at 500 West 52nd Street uh, to express our enthusiastic support for the proposed zoning change for Site 7 um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I can only speak in 
plain English because I'm not a real estate person, but um, I understand that this project is going to yield 185 affordable housing units in Hell's Kitchen. And as someone who's worked in the theater in Hell's Kitchen for 20 years, including the last seven at Ensemble Studio Theater, where we work with hundreds of theater artists per year, developing 200 plays per year, um, so many of our artists are no longer able to afford to live in the neighborhood. Um, it is in part the theater district and the work that we do depends on having affordable space both to work in and to live in. And so this is a huge a, a yield of affordable housing if this proposed zoning is approved and we can only enthusiastically support any effort for any remaining affordable square footage in our neighborhood. Um, our own theater business model relies on affordable workspace. As a deve developmental theater, we present hundreds of new plays a year in varying states of red readiness before we invite the critics. And a lot of that work is done for free in front of the public. You know, working in theater, you need the public to participate, to know what you've got, to know if it's good. And so a lot of the work we do is free or very low cost to the public. We bring 13,000 people a year to our building and to our neighborhood. And we applaud uh, Clinton Housing's efforts to preserve the character of our neighborhood as a home and workspace for artists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sleet. Questions? Thank you. Uh, Thevia Walters <laughs> for an encore performance. <laughs> Long time, long time. Um, good morning, Commissioners, Debbie Walters. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to represent the city and testify in support of the Site 7 project. We call this project Site 7 because the city-owned land was within Site 7 of the now expired Clinton Urban Renewal Area. And although the plan expired in 2009, the community has used the goals of this plan to guide the redevelopment of the area over the last 40 years. Um, one of the main goals that um, that I hear from the from the community board and that they cite often is to provide for a range of income bands and housing that exhibits good design in terms of privacy, light, air, and open space, while providing community facilities, parks, retail uses, and parking. And it's our belief that this project accomplishes this. Historically, House Kitchen included a mix of older tenements and bulky loft and manufacturing buildings. Over the years, the manufacturing uses in the area have started to move outside of New York City and more residential development has moved in. But none of that development has occurred without the input from the community in an effort to carefully manage the redevelopment of the neighborhood. This project is an outstanding example of the strong role of community in implementing the goals of the Clinton Urban Renewal Plan and the partnership between local nonprofit organizations, elected officials, and city government. We have a complete lineup this morning to go through the details of this complicated project. There's a 103-unit permanently affordable housing building that's being developed by CHDC, Clinton Housing Development. Um, um, is it a company or corporation? Company. company. <laughs> um, there is a 405-unit building that is 20% affordable, about um, 81 units, being developed by a joint venture between Taconic Investment Partners and Jerry Redman. And there is a historically significant former manufacturing building that is being converted into 22 units of affordable housing by CHDC. And there are also three beautifully planned and accessible gardens. I think the top line for HPD is that there will be approximately 208 units of affordable housing created across three buildings through the use of city financing, the inclusionary housing program, um, a partnership with an adjacent property owner, and through the use of city assets that include land and development, development rights. Um, and the site, uh, site 7 on block 1081, that's the last um, residential piece that's going to be developed on that block. Um, so that's a major accomplishment. Um, and on on Block 1080, um, where Captain Post is located, there are still a couple of residential um, projects that are that are um, future future development projects. Um, but Captain Post is a huge hurdle. 22 units. It's a beautiful building. It's historically significant. Um, also near Captain Post, we will be coming to you soon for the Irish Arts Center. Another um, great project. So um, I feel like we're making a lot of headway. Um, in this area, and the city is really excited about this. Um, 
So I, I thank you for your time, and I'm available to answer any questions. If I'm unable to answer your questions, which I may be, I think there are maybe 14 people after me. So we're going to cover you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walters. Questions, Ms. Bagley. Ms. Walters, good morning again. Good morning. Um, I am sure you'll be able to answer these questions. When you refer to the 208 permanently affordable units, which is quite impressive. It's almost 40% of the entire development, which is an intricate development. Um, are you referring to the modified income bans, the three levels? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Ms. Delos. Welcome again. Um, I can tell that you're really excited about this, and I, and I think that excitement is probably shared by many, many people. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I had asked a question in the review session about phasing. Any one of the folks in the audience could probably answer it, but maybe from HPD's perspective in terms of, um, you know, how have you calendar, calendared it um, for each fiscal year in, in terms of uh, rolling I think, out? I think once we close, we count the units. Um, but the phasing of development, and I'm sure there's someone else who can speak mm -hmm. to this much better than I can, but I'm fairly certain that the CHDC building, um, well, the foundation will go down first for the CHDC building and the Taconic Ritterman building. Um, and because the CHDC building is generating bonus, I'm sure those units will have to be created um, so that the other, so that the adjacent building can utilize the bonus. So um, it's going to be a very interesting phasing plan, but um, the development team has definitely worked that out. But we will count the units when we close. <laughs> <laughs> the, the very moment. <laughs> Um, <laughs> any other questions for Ms. Walters? Thank you very much, Ms. Walters. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa Matrissen. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Alyssa Matrissen, and I'm a project manager at Clinton Housing Development Company. As some of you know, Clinton Housing is a not-for-profit affordable housing developer. We were started in the early 70s to create and preserve affordable housing, primarily in the Clinton Hills Kitchen neighborhood. We are the project sponsor, as Debbie mentioned, for 540 West 53rd Street and 560 West 52nd Street. Um, both these projects are located in the Clinton Urban Renewal Area, which we have been involved in for a very long time. Um, since the early 1990s, us and other community organizations have been working together to solve a comprehensive plan for development of the remaining urban renewal sites. Um, we are basically following four key goals um, in our development of these sites, including maintaining moderate and low-income housing, promoting mixed-use development, protecting the existing tenants, and maximizing the available open space. Um, we really tried to follow these principles on this site, as I hope you see. Um, and we're excited to close out one of the few remaining development parcels on the urban renewal area. Um, as an organization, we're very excited about this project. It's really a model for us for future developments. Uh, it's been a great partnership so far with HPD and with our private partners, Taconic Investment Partners and Renderman Capital. Um, and most importantly, we're very excited about the amount of permanently affordable housing being created. It's over 200 units, and they're available to people at from 40% of AMI all the way up to 165% of AMI, in unit sizes from studios up to three bedrooms. We're also accomplishing the relocation of two long-term urban renewal tenants, um, Cyber Tire, who's been on the site since 1916, and Lenovo Lumber, who've been on the site since the 1960s as well as creating three new community gardens that will be available to the public. To accomplish all of these varying goals, um, we had to think long and hard about the site plan, um, and we decided that it would be necessary to do a large-scale plan. Um, so you can see in red here the outline of the large-scale plan on Block 1081. Um, and one of the things this allows us to do is be flexible with the bulk. Um, traditionally, in Manhattan, you have more high-rise buildings on the avenues and low-rise as you can see, it's a little differently here. Um, you have the Mercedes House, which steps up from 11th Avenue, AT&T Building, or Spoon Clinton, which all put the bulk in the mid-block. Um, so we want to kind of follow that development pattern to be a little more contextual with the site. So we step up from Dwight Clinton Park and the low-rise buildings on the avenue up to a height of 22 stories in the mid-block. Um, one of the other things we really spent a long time thinking about was the stretch of 53rd Street. It's a long block, and we have a really frontage. So we spent a lot of time thinking about um, the articulation of the street wall. We want to have two completely separate buildings. So you can see the Taconic Rutterman building over here and the Clinton Housing building. They have very different facades. Thought a lot about the streetscape experience um, to kind of try and enhance the pedestrian experience when you're walking along West 53rd Street over to the river. Um, 
So like everyone mentioned, it's a complex project. There's a lot of elements, but we spent a lot of time thinking about it, and we really tried to be comprehensive in closing out one of these last urban renewal sites. So thank you. Thank you. Questions? Ms. Chen. Uh, I have a timing question. Um, uh, so Cyber Tire will um, be um, on the site you know, after the project is built, but will they have to relocate somewhere in the interim, or will they be able to move... So you know, one day to the next from one. <laughs> they're currently at 724 11th Avenue on the block to the south. Uh, right over here. Uh, but they need to move to actually make way for the Irish Art Center project, which is expanding onto their current home. So they're going to be temporarily relocated to another garage on West 52nd Street. And then when we're done with the completion of our project, they'll permanently relocate to Site 7. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Knuckles and then Ms. Delos. Could you just speak to the sequencing uh, I see Building C, uh, which Clinton will develop. Mm -hmm. uh, when does that come in the sequencing of, of, of the development? Um, so they're all expected to be done approximately along the same timeline. Um, the demolition for the Taconic Ritterman building will take a bit longer, so we'll probably start our foundation first. But um, as W mentioned, our project needs to be complete in order for Taconic to realize the bonus mm -hmm. from the inclusionary development rights. So they're proceeding along the same construction schedule. Okay, so does Clinton actually, uh, I know it's their building, do they build it or does Taconic Ritterman build it? We are, they're going to build a foundation because there's so much interrelation that right. we don't want more problems. So they're going to build a foundation, turn it over to us, and then we're going to build the rest of the building. Thank you. Ms. Delos. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm just wondering, besides the uh, commercial tenants that are on the site, are there any residential tenants that are going to be uh, temporarily displaced? No, the only buildings on the site are commercial buildings. Okay. And I know during a review session we spoke a lot about the lumber yard and the relationship with the lumber yard and maybe a future grocery store. Um, uh, any more information that you can share about that would be great. Um, actually, Matt Deanstag, who's one of the principals of Lenoble Number, will be speaking after me. So. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks. Charlie Bandit. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, Commissioners. Um, my name is Charlie Bendit. I am a principal of Taconic Investment Partners. I'm here representing Taconic Ritterman, who is the development of part of this project. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, I'll just give you a little bit of background of Taconic Investment Partners. We've been in business since uh, 1993, 1997. In different iterations. You may know us because uh, we redeveloped uh, the Port Authority building, 111 8th Avenue, now the home to Google. We uh, redeveloped the Apple Store on 401 West 14th Street, 837 Washington. We're developing a condo project in Tribeca, 71 Late Street. We, redevelop we developed along with related the Caledonia on 10th Avenue. What you may not know about us is we also own and operate 1,400 units in the northeast part of the Bronx, which we have done a significant redevelopment of. We own and uh, converted um, a rental building in Brooklyn. It's the largest condo project in Brooklyn. It's 1,152 units. Um, uh, all of the units that have been sold have been sold to middle-income people. It's in East New York. Um, and we are the co-developer of the uh, what we call Essex Crossing. It was the um, Seward Park Urban Renewal Project. We are co-developers with L&M and BFC. So uh, we've done a lot. We're doing a few other things as well. I, I just want to make five points. Um, first point is that we're, we're honored to be part of this public-private partnership. We are the co-applicant in this um, initiative with the HPD. They haven't done too many of those, so we're honored to be one of the few that uh, they've done and to be partners with uh, Joe Restuccia and uh, Clinton Housing. Um, we're also proud that uh, this rezoning will provide a total of 39 percent of its total units will be affordable. Uh, it's somewhat unique in that um, this project will pro provide a wide, um, uh, a wide band uh, of affordable units for a variety of incomes. Forty percent will serve low income, the low income community. Thirty-five percent will serve the moderate income community, and twenty-five percent will serve the middle income community. In total, this action, as you've heard, will provide more than two hundred units, uh, affordable units. In addition to providing 20% low income in our project, which will be 
permanently affordable. Our project will also provide the equity for CHDC's three projects. So we're proud to be part of this. Um, uh, I think it goes towards what this administration's initiatives are to provide affordable housing at a variety of income levels. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to proceeding forward, which if approved, we will start probably in the beginning of the third quarter of this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Bennett. Questions? Mr. Mr. Knuckles. Uh, you forgot the banknote building. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you. For that. Thank, you for thank you very much. Sure. Uh, David Corman. Yeah. It's a lot of interest in a variety of things and capacity in a variety of things. Good morning, Chairman Weisbrod, Vice Chairman Knuckles, and Commissioners. I'm David Corman, Secretary of the Board of Directors of Clinton Housing Development Company. The Board is very excited about this project. We in the community have been asking for middle and moderate income apartments in addition to low income units to help preserve the economic diversity of the neighborhood. It hasn't been possible until now. The sale of both the excess development rights and inclusionary housing rights from 540 West 53rd Street to Taconic Ritterman provides the equity for these otherwise difficult to finance middle and moderate income units. In the past, too many applicants have missed the narrow low income bands by a few dollars mm -hmm. up or down. The board has wanted to address their need for affordable housing. Most new construction is only producing apartments for low-income households or, of course, market rate units. Um, in case you missed this point, the project includes units for households with incomes in six um, income bands, 50%, 80%, 100%, 125, and 126, uh, I'm sorry, 165% uh, of uh, area medium income. This is a very broad spectrum and we're, we're thrilled about it. The income range is from $24,080 for a single person to $141,735 for a four-person household. This is based on the 2013 AMI. Overall, as you've heard, 39% of the units are affordable. Importantly, all of these units are permanently affordable. To support our goal of income and social diversity, the project includes a large number of family-sized units. There are 168 two-bedroom and four three-bedroom units. That's 30% of the project total, 32%. Rents range from $581 for a 40% AMI studio to $3,560 for a 165% AMI three-bedroom apartment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Corman. Qu questions, Ms. Pataglia. Um, I thank you for clarifying the, the different income bands, the very many income bands. Uh, through my career, <laughs> I've been an advocate for the lowest income bands, but I do take my head off to this community board, uh, which has consistently put forth that there should be a wide range. Um, and, I'm, and I'm supportive of this. I, I would ask if possible, and maybe I should direct this to Joe, I don't know if he's going to be standing, but that perhaps at the end of the marketing, and this is done, and by the way, we also be invited to the uh, ribbon cutting. Um, no matter where we are at that point in space and time, Joe. Um, but I would be very curious to know at the end of the day, the numbers of households that apply for each income band as an assessment moving forward, because maybe this should be a prototype. Mm -hmm. So if you could perhaps at some point analyze that and get that back to us, I think that would be helpful to the city as a whole. I'm sure we and can I do that. Thank you for coming today. My pleasure. Ms. Delos. I, I just want to um, thank you for being here. I just want to uh, thank uh, Clinton Housing's leadership, the board, and uh, for, for really putting forward this vision of a mixed income community and, and being consistent with that and helping the entire community understand the value of that. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Corman. Thank you. Stephen Forneris. Forneris, is that? Learning. It's tough growing up with a French name. So I'm going to be speaking about uh, the CHDC building. My name is Stephen Forneris from Perkins Eastman Architects. I'm representing uh, Joe and Clinton Housing. And I'm going to speak more, most specifically about the uh, ground floor basement and then a little bit about the facade and then other parts of the team will speak a little bit more about uh, uh, the units themselves. So the real difficult part of this task for us was the relocation of the, uh, of the existing tenants. And this building is an unusual building because it has uh, commercial use on the ground floor, but also has residential use. And we have to be very careful that we didn't want the uh, commercial portion of the building uh, to overpower the residential. So we had a great opportunity that, I mean, you can see on the first, the first piece, that using the garden on the side of the building, we use that as the entry to the residential portion of the building. And we do a lot of architectural cues in the building to give uh, some prompts to you to tell you that something special has happened around the corner. When you look at the, if uh, we go from the ground up, we've got uh, the Lenovo uh, retail space uh, on the ground on the lower level. There's, uh, sorry, the Lenovo, they're taking a few spaces. And Cyber Tire is going to have some space in the basement as well as, as, long, as, well as uh, some amenities for the building, bike storage room, mechanical rooms, things like that. When you go up to the first level, the, uh, as well, uh, Lenovo is going to share some space in our building, as well as Cyber Tire. And you can see some uh, gracious community spaces. The entry to the residential portion of our buildings on the side, and a community room, which will be uh, off to, the, uh, to Adams Garden. The building itself, uh, as well, has, a, in terms of the, um, the ground floor, you have a loading dock in the building. The loading dock, we were required to have space for one truck. We left spaces for two trucks. And if you notice, it's all the way in the back of the building. We wanted to make sure the trucks could be pull, uh, fully pull into the building and not become a nuisance to the neighborhood. And a lot of that uh, consideration was taken for uh, the uh, commercial spaces as well. They have very generous openings on the facade to allow them to, uh, to things to pull in. In terms of the, of the facade itself, I'm just going to pull this one over here. Here. The, we tried to make the building fit into the industrial commercial background that it comes from. So we, we are, are using a red brick. We're using two different types of red brick. There's a, a extruded, uh, sort of a more formal extruded red brick on the front of the building. And then I, uh, a molded brick on the side of the building, which is something you see a lot in New York where when you turn the corner you get kind of a a different quality, more rustic quality brick. So the back and the side have that, uh, that quality. The arches and the molding are going to be made out of brick. It's a, a kind of something, a traditional quality that you don't see a lot of in buildings uh, nowadays. And we have some great masons we've worked with in the past that are going to be working on some nice details. There's going to be some terracotta uh, colored casting details that are going to be on the top and the sides of the building as well. Again, trying to make this as a friendly neighbor that fits within the building. The, uh, to give it a residential scale, even though it does have nice, big, wide, open windows, they're double-hung windows uh, to make it feel like you're in a little bit more of a residential-type uh, neighborhood. The archways, all of the elements that are seen on the facade were elements that we found within the area. So we tried to make it fit within the area and make it, make it comfortable. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Forneris. Mr. Knuckles. Uh, while we're not here to gauge aesthetics, uh, it's never stopped us from coming. <laughs> um, no, I was just saying to the chairman, I, I think that's an extraordinarily handsome building. Uh, it, it looks like it uh, was one that would have been constructed in the early 20th century. So I, I just think it's a, uh, uh, a very, very handsome building. Uh, and uh, GH, uh, DC should be very and will be, I'm sure, very proud of this mm -hmm. building. This is the building that Carl's distinguished and beloved predecessor would have loved. <laughs> I am sure. Yeah. Um, Ms. Vitaglia. I just want to chime in on that. The, the architecture is, yeah. is magnificent, and congratulations. Well, thank and, we had a lot of help. In the and to our vice chair, you weren't here in the early 20th century, were you? I'm <laughs> <laughs> <Only> not kidding. <laughs> thank you. He's read a lot of it. <laughs> I just have a quick question. Ms. Delos. Um, I'm just wondering, could, could you just comment for a minute about the, the square footage of the apartments? 
square footage of apartments. Yeah. We have kind of, uh, there's a range of square footage of apartments, and if you're, uh, for those people looking for apartments, you want to be looking for a studio apartment because uh, some of the studios are rather large. Uh, they're between 600 to 700 square feet for, uh, for some of them. It's just kind of the way it worked out. Uh, the uh, the one bedrooms are about 39 one bedrooms. They're around 900 square feet for those. Uh, the uh, uh, two bedrooms, about 49 two bedroom apartments, uh, about 1,100, 1,200. So it's again very gracious. And uh, four uh, the uh, the uh, four re uh, four three bedroom apartments around 1,300. So they're nice size apartments. Uh, a lot of the team is really envious that we want to be able to move into these things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other any other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Fournier. Did you the um, <laughs> Gary Handel. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, Commissioners, uh, it's a pleasure to be before you, um, and it's been. Uh, a great pleasure to be part of this team with HPD, Clinton Housing Partners, Community Board 4, and our clients, Taconic Ritterman. Um, we're the architects um, for, that, um, for that piece. It really has been an extraordinary experience and really something that I think could be you know, a model for develop, how development moves forward um, in this city. Um, uh, the, on the overall, our piece are uh, these two structures, one of which fronts on to 52nd Street, the other that fronts on to 53rd. One will be a 14-story structure, the other 22. Um, all in, we'll have about 405 uh, units of housing, which, as mentioned, 20% will be affordable. Um, within those, we, uh, in terms of anyone who's a connoisseur of unit types, we have over 89, which is basically dictated by the structure, ranging anywhere from uh, a, you know, small studios at just over 400 uh, feet to uh, larger apartments in the 1,400 um, square foot range. Um, as mentioned, um, you know, this has been a collaboration Oops. with Board 4. Um, uh, and, and you know, basically in early consultations with city planning. The goal was really to create um, a variegated streetscape along this long stretch of 53rd Street. And we embarked uh, along with our uh, partners um, with a strategy to break up that street wall. So our building on 53rd Street includes this three-story base, a series of five vertical elements which rise to a varying degree of height, five-foot setbacks, which then coordinate with the Clinton Housing building, rendered in a similar material so that we both have almost this weaving of, an, uh, of a variegated brick street front and then a five-foot setback, which also coordinates between the two buildings, and then the stair step, which accommodates most of the bulk on the site, which then comes into the Archstone Clinton um, building. On the streetscape, which, and, and again, one of our big challenges was really to civilize 53rd Street. Um, and so the, um, you know, it's a very long frontage. So the idea is really to continuously um, replant it um, with street trees, with planter beds, uh, with additional lighting, and if possible to work with uh, the other developments on the site um, in order to basically um, bring them uh, more into the urban fabric. Um, you can see we have a consistent um, series of storefronts both on 52nd and 53rd Street that are uh, you know, that, uh, accommodate retail amenities and and our lobbies um, that will actually be a much more welcoming feature um, you know, to the site. And our goal is really to have this entire development integrated uh, well into the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a, a little unclear. The, the only two uh, ground floor retail uses will be cyber tire and the supermarket if the supermarket gets built. Or, but you, I think you're implying that there would be we have additional a, retail. Well, uh, Matt Deanstag will speak about the Lenoble space, and he can talk about you know the the, poss the possibilities of that. But in terms of the expression of that, we basically wanted a traditional retail bay. And, you know, so basically, um, we have brick piers 24 feet on center, openings that are approximately 20 feet wide, in order to reestablish you know a, a more friendly rhythm um, along uh, 52nd and 53rd Street. Okay, questions. Mr. Knuckles. No, just an observation. I think uh, this, uh, the composition of this building uh, that you've just described, Gary, certainly in, in conjunction with the other one, uh, just brings a, uh, a mass of uh, very high quality uh, uh, 
edifices to uh, 53rd and 52nd Street. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. I'm trying to maintain an air of equality here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I, Mr. I, no, I, I would have said it anyway. I mean, Gary's, Gary's good architect. He knows that. He doesn't need me to tell him that. Uh, uh, any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hanger. Uh, Brian Back Schneider. Thank you, uh, and good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Brian Backscheider. I'm a project manager with the Clinton Housing Development Company, uh, and I'm going to talk about the third building uh, that we haven't gotten to yet, which is the Captain Post building on West 52nd Street. Uh, this building uh, is a five-story industrial building, uh, which was built in 1883 as the Travers Brothers Rope, Twine, and Hammock Factory. Uh, later, it was owned and operated by the Captain Post Pickle and Horseradish Company, which is how it gets its name now. Um, that business closed in 1986, and the building has been mostly vacant since that time. Um, CHCC got involved with this property in 2006 um, when it was designated as the net leasee uh, with HPD. And since that time, we've looked at a lot of different scenarios for uh, what to do with the building. Uh, the floor plans uh, are a challenge. They're wide and deep um, and our current plan um, that we've we've come to today is the is a uh, uh, two bedroom 14 two bedroom uh, units and uh, eight studio units in the building and the building will be redeveloped um, as a historic renovation uh, the building was put on the rational register in October 2011 uh, and the project will be financed together with a small tenement building at 464 West 25th Street. Uh, the units will be affordable to 80% and 100% AMI. Um, and like others have said, we're excited to be able to hit uh, this level of affordability, which is uh, something that we're striving to do uh, more and more. Uh, the ground floor of the Captain Post building will be a community facility, uh, which we hope will be the uh, permanent home for the Police Athletic League, uh, which is currently in a city-owned building uh, next door. Um, and the project is being financed with a combination of um, sources, the Multifamily Preservation Loan Program with HPD, um, Historic Preservation Tax Credits, and it will also uh, be using equity from the sale of development rights um, on Site 7, and really the project wouldn't be possible uh, without that piece of financing. So Site 7 um, is creating more house units on 52nd Street than also on 25th Street as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Backschneider. Questions? Ms. Battaglia. Uh, part of the site is a keyed community garden. Can you explain how That's gonna work? that sure. will be? <laughs> we actually have another speaker, um, Shanti Nagel, in our office um, that will speak to all the public spaces uh, on this project and how the community uh, gardens and key gardens work. Okay. And I have one other question. I thought I heard you say the, the building, uh, most of the building is currently vacant? vacant? The, the building is currently completely vacant. Oh. It has been mostly vacant since 1986. Yeah. Thank there was a couple small ground floor users in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Matt uh, Deinstag, is that Deinstag or Deinstag? Deinstag? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Matthew Deinstag, Vice President and a Principal of Lenoble Lumber Company, which started in 1965 in Clinton, in the neighborhood we're talking about. Lenoble's operations were spread over eight different sites on West 52nd and West 53rd between 10th and 11th. Um, and over the years, we had a shuffle and move from site to site to site to make room for different uh, housing developments. It was a burden on the business to move our operation from these sites, but it was in furtherance of a common goal, which was the mixed-use character of Clinton, uh, mixing the industrial, the commercial uses, the residential where we drew so many of our employees, the artists that make uh, Clinton so diverse. But about 10 years ago, we realized that in order to consolidate the business and to facilitate the development of the last remaining parcels of the urban renewal area, um, we had to temporarily relocate out of Clinton. We had to move out, wait for the appropriate buildings to be built up so we could move back in 
and become a neighbor again in the area where we've been for almost 50 years. In 2005, we entered into a memorandum of understanding with the City of New York, memorializing that agreement. And in 2007, we actually relocated out. We moved our lumber, our trucks, our equipment from all of our different sites in the urban renewal area out to where we are right now in Long Island City, still with the intention of coming back and being part of this community as a lumberyard. Um, more recently, however, it became apparent that um, a large lumber operation like ours might not be appropriate on 52nd and 53rd Streets mid-block with all of the increased housing developments, residential developments that have been going on and the increased uh, pedestrian traffic, it might not be a good mix to have our forklifts, tractor trailers, loading and unloading of over 20 delivery vehicles, our hours of operation right where all these pedestrians are and right where all this housing is. So when we came to that decision, we started to discuss with community leaders how could Lenoble Lumber still be a part of this neighborhood where we've been for so long? And what would be the best use of the facilities Lenoble Lumber has? Um, one of the facilities we had was a privately owned condo that uh, we owned since 1985 that's on the site of what will become the Taconic Ritterman Tower. The other sites we had strewn out became city-owned property with the uh, designation and the condemnation of the urban renewal area in 1969 to 1972. So how could we come back and use our sites, one, as a business, but two, also to be parts of this neighborhood? And it became clear that one of the great needs of the Clinton area was an affordable supermarket. So at that point in time, we directed all of our efforts to partner with uh, a supermarket that would meet the needs of all the Clinton residents. Not a high price, not a low price, but someone who could meet the needs of every resident of the area. And uh, that's where we've been directing our efforts. Uh, as of today, we're in negotiations with a number of markets, and some of these negotiations are actually at the stage where we're negotiating numbers. So it's moving and it's proceeding very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deansteg. Um, questions? About the yes. Affordable food market. Would you by any chance know if this uh, property is located in a fresh market zone? That's one of the things that our brokers are looking into, whether the supermarkets could take advantage of the fresh market um, program. Okay, so you, you don't have, you don't. You I don't know offhand. Thank you, sir. Ms. Ms. Dela uh, Thank you for the the trip down memory lane in terms of the, the history of Lenoble Lumber, so maybe we'll have Lenoble Supermarket. Uh, but uh, um, at, at what point uh, is there go, no go decision as it relates to supermarket? I think obviously there seems to be a genuine desire to make that work because there's obviously a need. Um, having negotiated with supermarkets, I know it can be very challenging to kind of meet the price point oftentimes. Um, that, that they need since the margin is so small in the business. So uh, at what point do you think you'll know whether or not it's feasible for that to work out? And if it doesn't, what's, what's plan B? Okay. Well, at what point is we'll take this as far as we can. Obviously, the, the development will take a couple of years to build. Right. And at the time when our space is handed back over to us, I'd love to have a tenant who can start building it out immediately. But that's still, we have a long window before that happens, which is good to, to do all these negotiations. Uh, in the case that we can't come to terms with a, a supermarket that would meet the, t the needs of the neighborhood, one, we've already committed to uh, coming before the community board and the borough president to consult with them about who any potential tenant would be. Um, and it's also important to realize that in regards to any future potential tenant, Clinton Housing has final approval over any tenant I put in there. So they're looking out for the needs of the community as well. Um, a point was made earlier about other uses and other retail that might be in there. Yeah, we've had supermarkets of interest of a lot, most of the space and some that don't need all of the space. So one of the things we've been looking into, for example, in the lower level uh, after talking with community people was the possible need for um, community medical facilities. So we've also had negotiations and discussions with the major hospitals who do community faci medical facilities to see if that would be an appropriate use in the area. Ms. Battaglia. You had mentioned when the, when the space is handed over to you, is, is that going to be a condominium? Is that going to be a rental? It's a condominium. There's actually two spaces. 
Um, as I said, we used to own a condominium on the site of what will be the Taconic Ritterman mm -hmm. Tower. That's 16,000 square feet on the ground floor. That once that tower, is, that development is built, that will be deeded back to us. The other uh, 10,000 on the square feet with space uh, 15,000 on a lower level will be purchased um, from purchased by Lenoble as a condominium unit from CHDC at market value. Thank you. So uh, you intend to, um, the current plan is to lease to a supermarket and continue to own both spaces. So you'll currently, your current condominium plus the space that you will acquire? Yes. Is that, and that's, you plan to own it for the foreseeable future or do you expect that you would sell to a supermarket or whoever the lessee was? Well, I don't know what the future will bring, but we have no intention right. of, of relinquishing it at all. We've been part of the neighborhood, as I said, since 1965. It's where, you know, where our roots are. So we have no intention of leaving the area. And what's the length of the street frontage that you would have? Uh, I believe it's approximately 125 feet on, uh, on uh, 53rd Street. And there's a smaller, I think, 75 feet on 52nd Street because it's a street through um, property. Uh-huh. And if a supermarket went in, the idea would be there would be entrances on both streets or? Ideally, I would love a supermarket who wanted the entire space. Um, it depends on what their needs are. Um, it's, it's tougher mid-block than it is on an right. avenue to get a good partner in there, mm -hmm. but it all depends on what their requirements are and what they want. Ideally, yes, it would be the entire space street through. And, and so the total ground floor square footage would be how much? 16,000 feet? Did well, you say? 16 plus 10. So the total combined of the two units would be 26,000 on, on the ground floor and 15,000 below grade. So if the supermarket was smaller than 26,000, I mean, ideally it would be 26,000 square feet, would there be other retail that you would contemplate putting in or is... Oh, well, there would have to be. If, if a yeah. supermarket doesn't want the entire space, obviously it wouldn't be good for me or for the neighborhood right. to have it vacant. So we'd have to look at other uses as well. Again, in consultation with CB4 and with the approval of CHDC. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. John Everett. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, my name is John Everett. I'm the uh, president of Cyber Tire Corporation on 11th Avenue. Um, excited to be a part of this project. Um, this year we're celebrating our 98th year in business on 726 11th Avenue. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to that 100-year that yeah. uh, mark. <laughs> <laughs> and um, perhaps thanks to the potholes in New York City. <laughs> We're going to get there. <laughs> Business uh, must be booming. <laughs> <laughs> um, CyberTire, um, we're, we're, a, uh, we're a small business. We have um, approximately 10 employees. Um, uh, you know, employees are from the neighborhood, um, from the immediate area. And um, we serve the needs of the, of the city and, and, and the community in several ways. We, uh, we work with governmental agencies from the federal government, the state, and the city major corporations and um, also um, residents of, of, you know, Hell's Kitchen and other, um, you know, areas of the city, you know, providing tire service and automotive repair. And um, we're sort of really excited to be a part of this project and uh, commend Joe Restuccia and, you know, Clinton Housing Development for um, working with us to enable us to relocate to 53rd Street. Um, where we're excited to continue uh, to serve the needs of the community. Um, and that's pretty much what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Every Questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Marcy Kessner. Usually when I need a tire, I need it immediately, and it's got to be in Brooklyn. I'm short. 
Good morning, Chair Weisbrod and Commissioners. I'm Marcy Kessner. I'm a planner with Kramer Levin, a land use council to uh, Taconic Ritterman Partnership. Uh, HPD and the co-applicant are proposing a series of zoning actions to allow for the construction of the two new buildings on Block 1081 containing 508 dwelling units, of which, as you've heard, a substantial number will be affordable. The provision of community open space, the protection of the rights of existing arts and arts-related uses within 545 West 52nd Street. Uh, these actions also allow for the relocation of two long-time Clinton commercial uses on the block in accordance with the HPD MOUs, as you've heard. The zoning actions will also facilitate the rehabilitation and expansion of, a city, of the city-owned building on Block 1080, the Captain Post building, with approximately 22 affordable units and provision of open space there as well. Um, I'm going to explain, describe some of the zoning actions and Gary Tarnoff will then follow up and do the others because we can't fit it all into three minutes. Um, the <laughs> the I hope I can get through mine in three minutes. <laughs> that's concurrent with this, one of the text amendments that's concurrent with this will extend the western sub-area C2 of the Special Clinton District to those portion, to the portions of blocks 1080 and 1081 so that they'll work in tandem. The changes will permit the development of residential uses and increase the development density on these sites. Uh, special height and setback regulations apply in R8 and R9 districts within western sub-area C2. The second action that's uh, before you is the text, or text amendments to the inclusionary housing program and the Special Clinton District in order to expand the boundary of inclusionary housing designated areas and to expand the range of income bands that generate inclusionary housing bonus floor area. And that will only be within the specific locations within R8 and R9 districts within western sub-area C2 of the Special Clinton District. And um, these maps, which I can go through, um, are basically show the changes. This is the uh, change in the inclusionary housing designated map, uh, map two, which is part of Appendix F of the zoning resolution. And that shows how we've now extended the area that's uh, inclusionary housing program designated so that it covers these sites. Um, this is the Special Clinton District map, and this shows the existing sub-area C2, and it shows how sub-area C2 has also been designed to now include these areas, which have been rezoned. Okay. <laughs> um, well done. Okay. Well, <laughs> there's a bit more, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, sure the next presentation will okay. be seamless. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, thank you. If there are any questions, questions? actually... Ms. Delos. Yes. Marcy, hi, how are you? Thanks I'm for fine. being here. Um, I just want to highlight something that you said about yes. the change uh, in terms of income bans for the inclusionary housing. Yes. So, it, it, so as you said, it, it, just to confirm what you said, it really only applies to this particular area. Um, and, nor and normally for inclusionary housing, there's a 33% bonus for 20% affordable. Obviously, in this case, we have 39% affordable at, a, at the six-band ranges that we heard about earlier. Right. Um, so I just want to confirm that that's just for this area at this point. Um, this, this is using a model for the, um, for the inclusionary housing program, expanding the bands, uh, which has been used in uh, other districts, which is included in the, in the section on inclusionary housing within the um, within in uh, the residential text. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Kessner. Any other questions? Thank you. Gary Tarnoff. Good morning, Chairman Weissman, 
Royce Brad, Vice Chairman Knuckles and Commissioners, Gary Tarnoff, Grim 11, Neftal Frankel, LOP, Land Use Council, Tutaconic Ritterman. Uh, let me just finish up Marcy's testimony quickly. There was one other zoning text amendment, and that referred to the existing, existing uses on block or proposed for block uh, 1081, that is Cyber Tire uh, and Lenovo Lumber. Allowing those to be located uh, in the C2 in the proposed C25 district, that would be an amendment to the special Clinton text, and an amendment to the special Clinton text to grandfather all of the uses and provide that they're conforming that are now located in the 545 uh, West 50 uh, Second Street building. Uh, that's the building that the first person who testified was talking about. Uh, the next, the additional actions proposed are a UDAP designation for the Captain Post site and the city-owned uh, properties to be developed on West 53rd Street and the disposition by HPD of those properties to a private, to a, to a developer. Uh, we're also proposing on uh, Block 1081, a, uh, as mentioned before, a large-scale general development of approximately <coughs> 90, with approximately 95,000 square feet of lot area. That will facilitate the transfer of approximately 11,000 square feet of floor area from the existing buildings in the R8A section of the large-scale plan fronting on 11th Avenue, and waivers of uh, uh, height, setback, front, front, front setback, rear setback, connection with the, uh, the Clinton uh, housing development and with the Taconic Gridman development, essentially because the bulk is being moved to the bid block, uh, uh, scaling up to Archstone, where the higher buildings are in that area. Um, the last thing that we're requesting is a uh, modification of curb cut limitations. Uh, you're allowed one curb cut on the zoning lot. There's now on each street. Now we have 11 curb cuts on West 53rd Street. Uh, we're proposed to reduce. We're proposed to, proposing to reduce the 11 curb cuts to three, so that there'll be one for Cyber Tire. One for the Nobles uh, Park, one for the Nobles loading, and one curb cut for approximately 50 spaces of accessory uh, parking in the basement of the Taconic Gridman building. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tarnoff. Questions? Ms. Delos. Hi, thank you for being here. I just had a question about um, the grandfathering of uses. Sure. Um, so, is that, how long does that grandfathering last? And so, you know, if it be, if Lenoble Lumber becomes Lenoble um, Supermarket and then 30 years from now decides to become Lenoble Lumber again, how does that work? Uh, there's no time limit proposed. Uh, the zoning was proposed to comply with the memorandum of understanding between HPD and the developer. Thank you. Thank you. Shanti Nagel. Um, thank, it is still morning, yes. Um, thanks for having me. I'm here to tell you a little bit more about our, street, our streetscapes and our green spaces. Um, first, just quickly about our city, our street trees. Um, CHDC at the moment is very proud. We take care of over 100 street trees, and they all now have what we call sidewalk gardens incorporated into them. They, if you look at the first board here, this is actual pictures of CHDC's current um, sidewalk gardens. They are underplanted. The city trees are underplanted with a mix of shrubs and perennials and a real natural-looking environment along our streets in Hell's Kitchen. It adds an amazing environment to walking down the street. We do care for over 100 of these, and in the new Site 7 project, we'll, um, we'll add over 20 to the 100 that we now have. Um, so that's the street trees. But if we go to the key parks, which I know you, you want to know more about, um, this is our current map of key parks. We started with Bob's Park in the mid-90s, and it has been running as a key park for all the years. The key is held at Community Board 4, and it was known as Bob's Park Key. It has now this season been switched to the Hell's Kitchen or HK Park Key because the white parks, Teresa's, and Juan Alonso are now added to the same key. So anyone who lives or works in the neighborhood can get this key for a, swapping, a whopping $2 <laughs> and um, has access to all these parks. Now part of Site 7, we'll um, add the other three, Adams Park, which is double 50 feet by 100, um, the Children's Garden on 52nd Street, and Captain Post incorporated into that development. Um, a little more about the design. Uh, if you can see this one, this is Adams, um, Adams Garden. 
and you heard about the community room that is part of that building, CHDC's building, though the garden will be incorporated with the community room, so you can use that. The access to the community room will be through the garden, as well as the entrance to the building. Um, there will be community plots in this one, in Adams, as well as a water feature and seating for community, and again, the use of it for community events, indoors and outdoors, which is really exciting. Um, the children's garden, we're planning with the help of the community. So this summer, we'll be going in and asking a lot of people their advice on what they'd like to see in terms of a children's garden, and that's on 52nd Street. And Captain Post is going to be a quiet, contemplative garden as it's up against many uh, residents. So we'll keep that quiet. Um, that's it. I'll ask, I'll look for questions. Questions? Ms. Pataglia. I just want to go back to the, the logistics of that key. You see yeah. key. There's a key. Anyone can get the key. Right. There's more once, than one key. Once the... <laughs> a copy of the key. No, I understand yeah. that. Once, <laughs> once the gated park is open, the entire community has access to it? Are there hours of operation? There are. Yes. Usually we're open till 8, eight to dusk. And we find that that's, that keeps the park easiest for maintaining. And there's no special requirement other than the $2. You come in, you get the key. You open Technically, the you're supposed to work or live in the neighborhood. Okay. Right. And again, the keys are, they live at CB4. Okay. And for the Captain Post building, anyone who lives in the neighborhood could also get that yes. key? All three of these green parks are on that key and open to anyone in the neighborhood. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Nagel. Thanks. <laughs> Jeff Rubin. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Jeff Rubin. I'm a planner with Philip Habib and Associates. And I'm, I don't have any prepared remarks, but I'm here if there's any questions about the environmental review of the uh, EIS for the proposed project. Um, any, any questions about the EIS for Mr. Rubin? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Very efficient. No, within three minutes. Well, within the three minutes. Very well done. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. I'm here from Taconic Investment Partners. I'm also here just to answer any additional questions that you might have. Keep it short before the afternoon. Commissioners, any questions? Thank you. Joe Vestuccio. Good morning, Chair Weisbrod. Good morning. And, <laughs> been many decades. Yes. Um, and, and good morning, commissioners. I am very happy to hear to be here to talk about this project today. I want to give some context, of course, as I always do. Um, to date, on the Clinton Urban Renewal Area, uh, Clinton Housing has directly developed 15 buildings with 178 affordable units since 2001. But additionally, we have helped facilitate the development of another five buildings containing 403 affordable units for a total of 581 apartment, affordable apartments since 2001 in this, in this two-block area. So we're very happy to be here on this last project, sorry, this penultimate project, <laughs> one more to go. Um, and the hallmark of it, as you can tell, is complexity and nuance. This has not been easy. We are balancing multiple needs here. We have long-term commercial tenants who basically held this area together. Our community was not about to turn its back on them. We have the desire to build affordable housing, not just for low income, but for a range of income, because we feel that people in our neighborhood constantly are the $100 over, $1,000 over the income bands, and then get frozen out. We also wanted to make sure that we didn't have height here. Our community is fine with bulk, not height, and that's why you see that stepping up because towers are a problem with us. Remember, we are in the land of Hudson Yards to the south. So the goal here is to have bulk to get the maximum number of affordable units. The interesting part for us is those, so those six income bands because that's something we've never been never able to do before. Um, and the fact that we can serve people who are making from the low 30s up to 140000 for a family of four to us is a miracle. And to have the majority of those be family units. And then on top of it all, to have 39% affordability. And I might note, it's permanent affordability, not just the inclusionary. Clinton Housing is self-imposing on the HPD properties, permanent affordability. Mm -hmm. So we think, to speak to Michelle's question, it is possible, developers can do it, not-for-profit mm -hmm. can do it, and that is our desire, so that's, that's what we're doing here. Um, I will take any questions whatsoever on this complex part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, that, that, that's it. I, um, I, I think the team's really spoken. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Astuccio. Ms. Vitaglia. 
Joe, I still remember the day I met you almost 20 years ago. I was <laughs> impressed with you then, and I'm still impressed with you now. I love the step You should have seen him 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Carl meant. <laughs> Boy, you make me feel like a novice in this class, you know? Um, I love the step up. I, I think it's, it's wonderful. You are a trailblazer, and I believe you will go down in history if you haven't already, Joe. Um, the landscaping, the, the, the sidewalk, uh, streetscape is, is wonderful. Um, in my experience with affordable housing developments, it's really hard to maintain such lavish, mm -hmm. um, give me words here. Greenery. Greenery. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Because you put most of the money into the, the development itself, the, the housing part of it. Just, I, I just want to get a sense from you. How do you manage to... I'm here to tell you that it's cheap. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that it's cheap because when you do something, you think about it and you engage with people who know how to do this. All these plants are local kind of plants. They are things that we try and figure out what survives and what doesn't. We replant. And our tenants and staff are totally engaged with it. And the community. In this neighborhood, that, those particular sidewalk gardens, I have seen tenants from buildings that we have yell at people saying, get your dog out of there now <laughs> and have a fight because our folks who work live in our buildings, they're very, they're long-term people. They're engaged in the neighborhood. And truthfully, it is, it is not that expensive if you take some time to do it. it just as I think it's wonderful. I'm in total support of this penultimate <laughs> development and totally look forward to the ultimate. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Ms. Deleuze. Joe, again, uh, thank you for being here. Congratulations on putting this together. I, I'm just, if you could share briefly, how did it all come together? Because this is, it is very complex and a lot of moving parts, a lot of different stakeholders. And, you know, I think these are the kinds of, there's probably quite a few lessons learned in, in your experience that could help other um, areas. So well, I, briefly, obviously. I would think one of the key things with this urban renewal area is that the, instead of looking at the commercial tenants or people on the site as obstacles to development, our community engaged with them. And by when the Archstone project happened, Lenoble Lumber had all these sites, we sat down with the HPD commissioner and said, if we figure out a way to be quite blunt, make a deal, and everyone works together, come to an MOU, other projects can move ahead. And to do that, we said, okay, if you will move possibly off-site, then you can come back as a lumber yard. Well, that was a big leap to say for Clinton Housing to go and say, we want to build housing above a lumber yard. Hmm. We have built housing above another garage on West 51st Street, 505 West 51st, because the, the company was there since 1947. Instead of looking at these as obstacles that must be cleared out and the city sort of cleaned of its feel, you say, how do you f incorporate them in? And I think that's the major thing that we discovered here. And the other part always is money, as you know, and how to make it work. Well, the combination of excess development rights, inclusionary housing, and the Lenoble sale, all these things come together with the city funds to make this possible. So I think it's, it's taking the time to sort of bat it around a long time, you see what sticks, and then move ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Congratulations on bringing it to this point. Thank you. Aidan Connolly. Chairman Weisbrod, Vice Chairman Knuckles, and Commissioners, uh, good afternoon. Um, I am Aidan Connolly. I'm Executive Director of Irish Arts Center, a multidisciplinary arts and cultural center with a long history in this community, occupying a three-story tenement at 553 West 51st Street since 1974. We have been working since 2006 on a plan to develop a permanent home for Irish Arts Center at 726 11th Avenue, the current home of our neighbor, Cybert Tire. We anticipate opening this new building in late 2016, the 100th anniversary of the Easter Rising, which preceded the founding of the Irish state, and incidentally, the 100th anniversary of Cyber Tire. <laughs> the rezoning under consideration is completely consistent with our own redevelopment plans in that it creates a new and permanent home for Cyber Tire and allows us to develop the new Irish Art Center on the existing Cybert Tire site. In addition, the low, middle, and moderate income housing that this project creates 
will be a boost to our efforts to contribute to a dynamic and diverse community together in this neighborhood and ensures that Irish Art Center and Cybert Tire and other cultural and commercial entities of long standing in this neighborhood can remain in that community. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Thank you, Mr. Connolly, and congratulations on your nice piece in the Times the other day. Thank you very much. Timing could not have been more exquisite, <laughs> as they say in comedy. Um, questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Christine Berthet. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Good morning Commissioners. Um, you know, I'm the Chair of Community Board 4, and I don't want to bore you because you have had so much details, so many details given to you by the experts. Uh, one thing I want to say is that Community Board 4 feels extremely fortunate not only to have this project, but to have uh, CHDC uh, part of our community and being so creative about doing the right thing, generating diversity, diversity of income, diversity of buildings, diversity of streetscape. And it just shows to, goes to show that when you work hard at it, uh, it can be done. So it's very, very exciting for us to be uh, for. Now, the question is indeed how to um, replicate that multiple times in our neighborhood. And in our neighborhood, we feel we can probably do it because Joe Rastushu is there, but how, what are you going to do? Can we replicate Joe? I mean, you know, that's the question. <laughs> and I don't know. <laughs> but I would encourage you very, very much to uh, look at this protocol and this process and framework and see how it can be replicated all over the city. 40% affordable or 50% affordable is what we need. Mm -hmm. And the different bands of affordability is what we need. And uh, thanks God, you know, it's really feasible. So uh, uh, thank you for supporting this project. And we are very proud to have this project in our neighborhood. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Questions? Ms. Battaglia. Not a question, just a comment. I want to say you could never bore us. <laughs> Even if you get close listening to your lovely accent. <laughs> That's <laughs> Thank you. And thanks to Community Board. Thank you. Jean yeah. Daniel Noland. Mm -hmm. uh, chair Weisbrod, Commissioners, good morning. Uh, my name is Jean-Daniel Nolan. I'm the chair of the Clinton Hills Kitchen Land Use and Zoning Co Committee of Manhattan Community Board 4, and I want to thank you for this opportunity, and I will be brief. Uh, Manhattan Community Board 4 recommends approval of this application. Now, I'm going to be even briefer. We like it. <laughs> and what's not to like? 208 permanently affordable units, 39 percent, three community gardens, a range of income bans, responsible developers. And as chair of the committee, I never have to write another letter on site seven, so I can talk <laughs> about that. I just want to say this has been a remarkable effort. The community, the community board, HPD, the developers have all worked together, I want to say for decades, but it's only been a couple of years, to put together this jigsaw puzzle to develop this site in a matter consonant with our goals and our aspirations. What had to come together? Well, affordable housing, number one, contextual design, and believe me, Vice Chair Knuckles, even though it's Hell's Kitchen, we do think about aesthetics. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Green space, height constraints, and working with our long time businesses in the neighborhood like Cybert Tire 1916. Uh, and not to mention the mind-bending but brilliant zoning prestidigitation. <laughs> had to do to get this. The Land Use Committee and Manhattan Community Board 4 unanimously recommended approval of this application and we urge you to do so as well. But being Board 4 in Hell's Kitchen, we want it to be as good as it can be. So we insist that all the affordable housing developed on the project site will be affordable in perpetuity, and all the affordable units in the Taconic Ritterman building will be randomly distributed throughout all floors, all floors of the building. Not 65%, not 79%, 100% of the building, and that's all i got to say. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Mr. Nolan. Questions? Thank you. Uh, Bob Benfato. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Benfato. I'm the district manager, Committee Board 4. I'm going to speak of a Queens accent, not a French one. <laughs> The benefit of being the 21st speaker is everyone has said exactly what I wrote. So this, this almost, Joe even stole my line on it being the penultimate development. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so really, I just came to say that the board four has been working on this project in concert with the applicants for many years. In fact, before I was a district manager, when I was in high school, in 2006 is when CHDC first came to the community board to look for preliminary conceptual support, which they got. They came back in 2007. I had all things in 2010. And then back with Taconic and Ritterman with this Rube Goldberg application that they came in March and April of 2013 and then December of 2013. And it will continue on for the near future. I mean, they talked about CW Post and they're going to put the PAL there. The last project is actually where the PAL is. So how it's all connected. And we continue to work with Lenoble Lumber to hopefully have the Lenoble Lumber supermarket. We're going to have a construction task force once the construction starts. And we have continual work on the community gardens that Shanti spoke about. In fact, uh, they came to our parks committee last Thursday to talk about the Children's Play Garden at 543 West 42nd Street. And I wanted to, to, in conclusion, clear one thing up. I know there's that park, Bob's Park, that I spoke about. It's not my park. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Michael Sandler. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Sandler, and I'm an urban planner at the office of the Manhattan Borough President. Uh, the proposed project represents a model public-private partnership that will revitalize an underused area in an inclusive manner. Western Clinton today is diverse in terms of both population and uses. The neighborhood is an example uh, of a mixed-use neighborhood where affordable and public housing, market rate housing, manufacturing and heavy commercial uses, cultural institutions and retail can coexist comfortably. The project will create 530 units of housing, 39% of which will be permanently affordable to a range of incomes from 40 to 165% of area median income. Um, on top of this impressively broad provision of affordable housing, the project will create two new and expand one keyed community gardens and will allow two businesses that have been long-standing members of the community to remain a presence in the neighborhood. The proposed development will not only fill in some of the last remaining city-owned sites of the Clinton Urban Renewal Area in a manner consistent with the goals of the Urban Renewal Area, it will also serve to maintain the diversity of a neighborhood into the future amidst the development pressure of the high-end residential market. Uh, the proposed text amendments will provide a larger zoning bonus for the inclusion of moderate income units, which are typically hard to finance with the subsidies available to affordable developers. Community Board 4 has a priority, has as a priority the inclusion of a wide range of income levels in affordable projects, and this proposed text allows for the furtherance of that goal. Furthermore, as the city looks to aggressively develop affordable housing, it should ensure that the new affordable housing, new available housing does not include moderate income families. The city should explore whether a bonus structure similar to this would be appropriate for all inclusionary housing developments. The proposed text amendments additionally provide for new uses not allowed as of right in R9 districts. The proposed allowable uses are consistent with existing commercial arts uses on the site and the need for the inclusion of Lunobo Lumber and Cyber Tire based on memoranda of understanding with the city. Lunobo Lumber may not be returning to the neighborhood, however, and the proposed text will allow lumber stores with no limitation on size in the space. Should Lunobo sell their interest in this site in the future, which they don't plan to do, um, but the borough president worries about the types of uses that could occupy the space based on this provision. Um, I'm out of time. I'm going to mention two more things briefly. Is that all right? Um, so the large scale um, enables the project to maximize affordable housing by shifting bulk to other areas of the site. We think that's appropriate on this particular block, uh, but we that the commission in the future don't uh, seek to uh, move bulk towards the mid block uh, as that could have negative effects on street life. And finally, the community board in the recommendation requested that affordable units in the Taconic Redmond building be distributed throughout the building. In the letter to the community board, the developer ensured this would be the case. In conversations with our office, however, it was indicated that 73% of floors would feature affordable units. Though the developer is including praiseworthy features, the board president does not feel that 
Senate floors constitutes throughout. Uh, the new building should be representative of the incredible diversity of the neighborhood and should aim to be fully integrated. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Robert Attenberg. Hi, my name is Robert Atterbury. I'm here testifying on behalf of State Senator Brad Hoyleman, uh, State Senator Adriano Espayat, as well as Assemblywoman Linda Rosenthal. Uh, we decided to do this all at once because it's pretty straightforward. Um, first, um, I'm going to be. I'm but you can't get nine minutes. You can only get. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm going to be very brief because I think I might actually be the last speaker, um, and I think it's all really all has been said, even that. Um, first, we want to applaud the uh, applicants' uh, commitment to affordability. Uh, they've really demonstrated a firm commitment to maintaining the economic diversity of the rapidly changing neighborhood. Um, as we know, the neighborhood has vastly changed over the past few years and decades, and it's really uh, becoming something quite different. Um, we also really want to applaud their commitment to uh, open space and green space. Uh, it's really quite unique, I, we think, in many developments. Um, we are very proud, and it's very rare for us to be standing up here sort of applauding applicants uh, for their commitments uh, to uh, both the community board. Um, it's my understanding that they have agreed to, for, I think, everything that the community board had asked for, um, which is both uh, amazing and wonderful, um, and we really uh, congratulate them on that. Um, with that, I think there is one ask that is um, still outstanding, um, and that uh, is that we ask the commission to ensure that affordable units in the Taconic Vinnerber building are evenly distributed, um, both by floors and exposures, including access to outdoor spaces and terraces. Um, it really, uh, we firmly believe that distribution of affordable units should reflect the distribution of unit types um, in the building as a whole. Um, and I think, they've, as everyone has already agreed to, the residents of affordable units should have the same quality fixtures and access to services as the market rate counterparts. Uh, it is really a part about integrating is really giving people the same uh, as, uh, as everyone else. Um, with that, um, we, and with the, the applicant's extraordinary commitment to affordable housing in mind, uh, street life and local community, um, we urge the commission to approve the project. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers wishing to be heard on this love fest? <laughs> um, with that, um, are there any other matters to be heard? Hearing is closed. Thank you. And meeting adjourned.